Surprise! It's a Crimes of Grindelwald review! Na, 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 sing my own theme song because it's a Crimes of Grindelwald review and not a normal book club episode. Okay, guys, I just saw Crimes of Grindelwald this past Thursday, and I have a ton of thoughts. So many thoughts, in fact, that my brain couldn't even write a normal book club episode. So, sorry, but yes, I will be pushing back the book club another week. We will pick up with Chapter 3 on Tuesday of next week. And first things first, yes, this video will be filled with spoilers for Crimes of Grindelwald. So, if you haven't seen the movie yet and you don't want it to be spoiled for you, I pretty much just click away right now because I can't promise that anything that I say from here on won't be spoilery. So, uh, yeah, if you haven't seen it, go ahead and click away in three, two, one. Bye! Okay, guys, let's get down to business. So the way that I'm going to structure this video is going to be basically, I'll start with some things, just some general thoughts, I'll move into complaints that I have, and then I'll move into things that I like, and then at the very end we will discuss my ideas surrounding that massive reveal, which, you know, I'll refrain from saying for this moment, just in case any of you still haven't clicked away from spoilers. If you don't want spoilers, click away now! Okay, first, my general feeling. From the start, I just want to say that I really loved this movie. <laughs> Ironically, I do have a rather long list of complaints, but I just can't help myself. I loved watching it. I was on the edge of my seat the whole time. I thought it was fun and exciting and just a solid movie in general. I think the cinematography in general was gorgeous. I think David Yates really pushed himself from what we've seen uh, from the fifth through eighth movies of the Potter series and the first Fantastic Beast film, it really looked distinctly different than what he had given us before. He really distinguished the style of this film from the other ones uh, right off the bat with the uncomfortably close-ups of faces right in the beginning. That choice really made me feel Newt's social anxiety in a very real physical way and kind of reminded me of who he is. So from a visual standpoint, I thought that everything was just perfect. The cinematography, the costumes, the sets, the just everything. And the script, which has its problems and I'll get into, did really keep me on the edge of my seat. Things moved along quickly enough to keep my attention and I never really found myself kind of losing focus, which tends to be a problem for me in movies that are long. But and I know this is what you all came for, let's get into my complaints. Okay, my biggest issue is with the script itself. There is so much that is crammed into this movie, and yet really somehow still not a lot happens. Almost the entirety of the film is everyone from like 10 different places just converging into one, and that takes up 99% of the movie. We have Queenie over here, and Jacob and Newt over here, and Tina over here, and Yusuf, and Lita, and Theseus, and Redence, and Nagini, and Grindelwald, and Grimson, and just so many different storylines. How are we supposed to care about all of these people when we've barely even been introduced to half of them? Of, the, of those characters that I've just named, we've spent almost no time with about half of them before this movie. So that aspect of the movie really left me feeling like I wasn't fully satisfied. Here is a list of other things that I feel got completely glossed over that definitely deserved more time. Jacob and Queenie getting back together. Nicholas Flamel. Nagini. Grimson and his betrayal of the Aurors. Circus Arcanus. Grindelwald letting that guy live when he threw him out of the carriage in the beginning. Credence's caretaker, who also only had three fingers and one thumb. McGonagall? Newt's spell that lets him see the near past. Queenie's entire journey in this movie. Bunty. The Niffler babies. And the Kelpie. So a couple of those things are a level of importance where I feel they either should have left them out or expanded beyond what they did and not just have stayed in that strange, glossed over middle place. The Niffler Babies and the Kelpie are pretty much what I'm talking about here. But everything in that list was really given no time, almost at all, and so much of it was built up to be so important. So let's take the most glaring example in Nagini. All of the build up to this movie led us to believe that Nagini was going to be so hugely important. And then what did she do? What purpose did she serve other than to be a friend to Credence and to follow him around. I would honestly be surprised if Claudia Kim had more than five lines in the entire movie. Her role in this movie was unnecessary. It was completely unnecessary, unfortunate. The next biggest example, Nicholas Flamel. Uh, when we all found out that F Nicholas Flamel was gonna be in this movie, we all freaked out. Like, how cool, right? But again, what purpose did he serve? The trailers, again, made us believe he was going to be a big part of this movie. Although it was cool to see him be actually a pretty powerful wizard at the end of the movie when they do the thing in the Lestrange tomb, but again, he really didn't serve any purpose. The last big thing to me was the circus. All of the trailers were putting the circus at the centerpiece of the whole thing. And I think we thought we would all spend a lot more time there, but again, it was just kind of a convenience to the plot that, like, it served as a place to explain 
Nagini's life at that current moment, but we barely even spent any time there. It was really just a gathering place for Tina and Yusuf to happen to run into each other because they're both looking for Credence. We get no indication of why Credence has joined the circus. We get no explanation of his f befriending with Nagini. We get no explanation of why Nagini is in the circus or how she got there. We're just there for like 10 minutes top. So with that, let's transition further into deeper disappointments that I have other than things that I just felt a little more deserving of more time. And the thing that I'm the most disappointed by is how JK Rowling kind of wrote a lot of the women in this movie, and yet again, she wrote another story where there aren't necessarily a ton of women, as stereotypes of themselves. The most glaring of which is Bunty. Bunty being Newt's assistant in his basement of magical beasts, <laughs> who could have been a cool, badass, awesome character. Instead, J.K. Rowling decided to go with that age-old stereotype of the timid, shy, assistant to the brilliant scientist who doesn't see that she's in love with him. I would have even been fine if she had just had feelings for Newt, but just didn't show it. But the point where I just got so disappointed with Bunty was when she was like, why don't you take off your shirt? It's like, it's so unnecessary. <laughs> like, this characterization of Bunty was just completely unnecessary, especially with how small of a part she played in the movie. We get it. Newt is desirable even though he doesn't realize that he is. So Bunty being such a stereotypical character to me is just so disappointing, especially from a writer who values feminism in her personal life and places that so highly and advocates for it and fights for it. It just kind of left me disappointed. I mean, J.K. Rowling is better than that. Then again, is she? Because Queenie in this movie was also kind of disappointing and kind of a stereotype. Queenie's behavior throughout this movie really to me seems contradictory to what we learned of her in the first movie. In the first movie she is kind and courageous and compassionate and powerful and empathetic, funny and flirty and strong and troubled. She's an extremely complex character. In this movie, she starts off having roofied her fiance. She has literally <laughs> bewitched Jacob to marry her. I understand her frustration and her desperation. She loves Jacob so much. But Jacob really isn't wrong in his arguments. He puts her life in great danger by them getting married. And their fight outside felt so cliche. He says he's being unreasonable. He says she's being crazy. She runs off to go see her sister. He goes off to his best friend to help him get her back. How many times have we all seen that exact scene in movies or books or TV shows? It was just so uninteresting. I don't blame Queenie for leaving him. Jacob thought a hurtful thing. I'm not saying she's wrong for leaving. I'm just saying the scene was anything but new or interesting. And really, I just think Queenie's behavior in this movie didn't make much sense at all. She's played off as a bit vapid early in the first movie, but we find out that she's actually strong and badass and awesome. She doesn't seem like the kind of person who would get wrapped up in Grindelwald's words. Like, I understand the appeal of what he's saying to her, but I think she would be able to see through that in spite of all of these feelings she's having and frustrations with not being able to marry Jacob. And if she loves him so much, shouldn't she at least consider that his gut feelings about Grindelwald might be something to listen to? And also, let's just skip right over how Queenie says she and Tina aren't talking anymore. Like, that's not an important thing to dive into, what happened in between those two movies. The Lita Love Triangle I thought was boring and they didn't really explore that enough. I got so little indication for how Lita feels about Newt now. No indication of a real, true love for Theseus. No indication of Newt's complicated feelings for Lita after all of this. Just, like, nothing. Can we talk about how Yusuf is basically just Inigo Montoya with an unbreakable vow instead of honor. He literally is only trying to kill Credence because if he doesn't, he will die because of the unbreakable vow. Real good reason to want to avenge your family, only because it'll prevent your death. Really, the entire Lestrange plot being uh, just one massive misdirection kind of annoyed me just because as soon as that became true, it immediately made it so that Yusuf and Lita were both it just right away disposable. Without the Lestrange connection being true, they are just completely unnecessary and uninteresting characters. Okay, too many dying babies. I get it. She wanted to show the whole Voldemort tried to kill a baby and couldn't do it. Grindelwald is so evil that he can kill babies whatever thing to show the difference between the two villains, but I just... It's too much. Too many dying babies. Can't take it. Last thing is that Lita's sacrifice, just so that the others could escape, really felt like a massive letdown. I can tell JK really wanted to feel really strongly in the moment, but she just didn't give me enough time and enough information to get to know Lita to be affected by her sacrifice. Besides, her sacrifice really did very little. She probably could have escaped with the others. She most definitely did not need to die. So, unnecessary. Okay, 
That's enough of that, you guys. Let's get some positivity flow. Here's all the things I loved about this movie. First and foremost is definitely Grindelwald himself. He is such a fascinating character. He is so vastly different as a villain than Voldemort. Voldemort gathers followers via fear. Grindelwald gathers followers by seducing them with his words. Like, that, that to me is so much more impressive as a character. Like, I would much rather watch that character than a character like Voldemort, who's just gonna be like, I'm gonna kill your whole family unless you follow me. He's also so much smoother with his magic. Like, just look at the way that he casts his spells. Voldemort is very punchy and forceful. Grindelwald, especially when he's in the Lestrange tomb, is like conducting the fire. It's also smooth and flowy, like, just so... Oh, cool. And his magic is incredibly creative, and this man never utters a single spell. I also found it fascinating that he kind of never really attacked anyone first. He only really fought back if he was attacked by someone else, and he's such a charismatic villain that he got all of his followers to do all of the dirty work, and then he himself just kind of sat back and defended himself if necessary. Even with the fire at the end, he basically said, hey, if you're my enemy and you try to cross this fire, you're gonna die. And Johnny Depp, not talking about his quality as a person, just his talent as an actor made him perfect casting for that kind of villain. His performance was incredible. Now, Newt! Ugh, I love Newt so much. He is everything. His masculinity is so positive. He is so awkwardly and uncomfortably charismatic. Eddie Redmayne is able to draw you in with his performance, even though Newt obviously would not want that. And this movie showed us that Newt is also an incredibly powerful wizard. Like, he was doing some incredible magic. Like, I know we all feel the same about Newton, I don't need to talk about it a lot, but it's just, he just continued to be the best thing about these movies by far. Also, Jude Law! Jude Law just strolls in here into his first movie as Dumbledore, and after his first three lines, he is already the best Dumbledore ever. By far, it's not even close. He captured the whimsy and the humor at the same time as all of the complexity and the darkness that makes up everything that Dumbledore is. He had all of the quiet power of Dumbledore perfectly. He captured the way that Dumbledore can command a room by doing as little as possible. He was just, like, absolute Dumbledore perfection. The Return to Hogwarts just tears. Jacob and Newt's friendship is just, like, so wonderful. Just, like, the trust that exists between them. I just love seeing such a positive male friendship. I loved all the, like, simple answers to some big questions we had. Like, uh, like when the head of the Department of Magical Law Enforcement just kind of says, no, Dumbledore, you're not gonna teach defense against the Dark Arts anymore. So just like, there's our answer, guys. Or Jacob just explaining super fast that the memory wipe just didn't work. Like, all along I had a feeling that we just needed to be patient and wait for these small answers to these kind of small questions, like, why is Dumbledore not teaching Transfiguration? Like, I knew it was gonna be simple. And okay, let's just be clear that Pickett, the Niffler, and the Zowu did the most amount of good in this movie. And they're pretty much the only reason that the heroes succeeded. When the Niffler got in there and snagged the blood pact from Grindelwald, I was so excited. <laughs> I ended up quite liking Theseus. Now, I know I'm a little bit biased because, like, Theseus is the textbook Gryffindor. But I thought he was extremely level-headed, really, he was really smart, and he knew who to listen to and when and why. And he clearly cares for his brother, even though they don't really get along all that well. He clearly wants to take care of Newt and to help him succeed. And the last thing, I was actually really glad that Dumbledore and Grindelwald had a blood pact instead of an unbreakable vow. And that's why Dumbledore says he can't move against Grindelwald. Because neither of them dies after they duel, so if they had made an unbreakable vow not to fight each other, then one of them would die. But I'm willing to bet that this blood pact thing makes it so that they really literally cannot fight. Like, Dumbledore's not just saying, I won't do it, he might literally be unable to try to fight Grindelwald. Maybe a blood pact puts that promise like literally into his blood and so he physically would not be able to raise his wand to attack Grindelwald. Okay, let's talk about the twist. Aurelius Dumbledore. Here's what my face was when he said that. I still can't decide if I like this or not. But it definitely had me shook. So of course I had trouble wrapping my head around this for like really long time after I saw the movie. And I will just say right now that I don't think we need to panic about a change of canon happening. Here. Because ultimately I think Grindelwald is just 
straight up lying. I think he is big time lying, and I have two reasons why. First, he says, your brother is trying to destroy you. Clearly Dumbledore doesn't want Credence dead. Like, that just seems like one of the most unlikely possible scenarios. In my mind, there's no way that Dumbledore actually wants to destroy Credence. And the second thing is this business with the Phoenix. We only ever see Credence with that baby Phoenix when Grindelwald is around. So, that's suspicious. Also, in the movie, the Phoenix flames from being a baby to being full grown, and I Pretty sure that's not how that works. In Chamber of Secrets, we see Fox when he dies. Dumbledore even says to Harry that it's a shame that he had to see Fox on a burn day. So clearly when a phoenix burns like that, it's related to its death. So I think what is going on is that Grindelwald has transfigured some other item or another bird into appearing to look like a phoenix. Because Grindelwald clearly knows that the only thing powerful enough to even have a chance of defeating Dumbledore is Credence's Obscurus. So he'll come up with whatever story he can to turn Credence against Dumbledore. And what would be a bigger betrayal to Credence than finding out that what remains of his family, the thing that he is searching for the most to know about himself, wants him destroyed. Grindelwald's true genius lies in his ability to deceive. We saw that from the first movie and we continue to see it during this second movie. So that's my theory, that Aurelius Dumbledore is just another complete misdirection and that Grindelwald is just lying. Okay, it's Kevin from the future here. I also forgot to mention that I did some research about the name Aurelius and all I could find is that it means the golden one, which is interesting because in this movie we do have an alchemist. Uh, and so if we think about Harry being the chosen one only because Voldemort chose him, it's interesting to think that Credence might only be the golden one because uh, Grindelwald has gilded him, which of course we know was pretty much the primary goal of discovering the Philosopher's Stone was to be able to take anything and turn it into gold. So it just seems like more support for my theory that Grindelwald really is just lying to Credence about his identity. And those are all of my thoughts on The Crimes of Grindelwald. Like I said, even though I had a long list of small complaints with it, I just can't help myself. I freaking loved this movie. And it definitely made me excited for the coming three more. Thank you guys so much for watching. Please subscribe if you haven't done so and share this video with all of your friends. And if you have the means and the desire, there are ways that you can support me in the description and on screen right now via my Patreon and my merchandise. I will see you guys next Tuesday for the return of the book club. Thank you for being patient with me, and I will see you then. Bye!